Thank you all for coming along. The third talk of the day, so uh, well done. You've all managed to survive two talks already this morning, third one in a row. Then we have lunch at least. Uh, okay, so I went through a number of different iterations of this title. Uh, I'm not sure which one works best. Talking a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about autonomy and what we learned as we scaled out autonomy at, at eDream to Digio. Yeah, I think the title on the on this on the um, on the flyers was around towards uh, organizational agility. I'm a great believer that organizational agility is not a destination; it's a journey. And so, at eDreams of we we feel that like we're on that journey. We're traveling in that direction towards increased agility. Will we ever get to Nirvana? Probably not. I would like to think that we're always growing and improving and there's always room to improve. And so there's no single place, no single destination that, that I want, that I think we'll, we'll get to, but then we'll continue to learn, continue to grow. And this is some of our learnings as we've been on that journey, some of the things that we've gone through, some of the things that we've learned, uh, and what we're looking at in the future and how we trial out the things that we're looking at in the future and how we see if they're going to work, if they're not going to work. So. A um, little bit about me, I'm the Agile Director at eDream the Digio. Um, I've worked for a load of different companies in, in the past, doing various roles from product owner to business analyst to transformation lead. Uh, I've been at eDream for about 18 months now, loving living in Barcelona. Um, we have a number of different brands and our our vision is to help people to explore the world. That's, that's the purpose that, that we have at eDream Village. But about five years ago, we were organized into these very traditional, very structured, organizational, functional silos. Everyone works with all the people who are doing the same thing as they're doing. And this transcended across our business and development. We had our own business units. We had our... Um, uh, we didn't have a product function at all, so we had developers, we had testers, we had people who supported the release functions, we even had a separate um, teams who did uh, maintenance. You didn't even have to maintain the code that you wrote. We had a separate team, and a separate function that did that. And strong functional silos. And, uh, and the, the problems with functional silos is from a, if you think of it from a, a social point of view, the, the functional, the, the them and us delineation, us is everyone else in my function. Them is anyone else outside of my function. Okay? So we have this very strong functional delineation within the organization, which doesn't help with collaboration when you create that, those social boundaries on functions. That didn't help us. And our ability to execute was good only within the functional boundaries of, an, of the organization. So the... Uh, the developers thought that they wrote great code. The testers thought that they tested really well. The people who supported it in production thought that the testers tested badly and the developers wrote bad code because they needed to support it in production. Um, so everyone, everyone functioned really well in their own function, but not so much across functions. And visibility across what it is that we were doing and how we were doing it was a fiction have a PMO function that pretends to be able to hold all of the information across what's all going on across the entire organization together. And they produce this as a set of reports that goes out about what we're doing and how we're developing and how much progress we made and when we're going to finish things. And it's all a fiction. Because the truth is we didn't know. The truth is we couldn't know. Some things took long, some things took short. For the rest, we had no idea. So that wasn't really useful. So we decided to try and make some teams out of that. What we did was we extracted individuals out of those functional silos, and we built some cross-functional teams. And we call those cross-functional team pods, right? So I might slip into saying pods. Pods for us are a cross-functional team. Uh, and we create at first we started with a little pilot. We created a few little cross-functional teams that seemed to work reasonably well. And so we started to scale that out. And we created a load of functional teams. And one of the things that we did while creating functional teams was we strongly encouraged the teams to be autonomous. 
we wanted autonomous teams. We strongly encouraged that autonomy. Uh, so we, we scaled out and we had a load of these small cross-functional autonomous teams, which is great. Except autonomy without alignment is actually quite chaotic. So we had a load of autonomous teams, but very few mechanisms to align them. So our del delineation between them and us became the team. No longer were we functionally separated, but now we had a social uh, construct of the team, and we delineated on them and us based on the team that we were in. Uh, our ability to execute was improved over the previous iteration, uh, but we were optimized around delivering within a team. Our teams were really good at delivering what they needed to deliver. But if we needed to deliver stuff that cuts across multiple teams, we were really bad at managing that. And each team, because they were entirely autonomous, and because they owned their own backlog, and because they quite vigorously defended their autonomy, which is good, it was part of the culture that we wanted to create, so we succeeded in creating that part of the culture, they vigorously defended, defended their autonomy, but what that meant is that when we needed to align multiple teams, it was a little bit like herding cats, because you get one going in the right direction and the others would be going off in the other completely different direction. It's so really, really hard to, to, to do that. And we had visibility only at the team level, good, much better visibility at the team level, uh, which was a massive improvement to what we'd had before, so it's a good step forward. Uh, but it was very hard at the management level to see the wood for the trees. Because if you have 52 different teams, we can take a look at 52 different Kanban boards and see exactly what stories they've got going on. But to coordinate that to understand how are those stories contributing to overall strategies, uh, that's a little bit more difficult. So next step we said, okay, well, let's, let's group these teams together. And we chose to group the team into areas um, and those areas are functional areas, well, not functional areas, I get that wrong, they are uh, customer areas, so we have like uh, teams that are con in interested in our funnel, and they the convert teams, and they all take ownership of that, and we have um, a, an area that is interested in our dynamic packaging, so selling of hotels, uh, and so they, we try to group them into areas that are kind of customer recognizable areas. And that's, and again, we, you know, a, a, a big step forward. So how did we do this? Um, we recognized that we couldn't scale to having agile coaches in every team. We don't have scrum masters in the team. We don't have agile coaches in the teams. What we did was extracted the agile coaches out of the teams. They stopped working on a team, team by team level. And they became part of the leadership group for each of these areas. Each of these areas has a product director, a development director. Uh, a QA manager and an agile coach as kind of a leadership team. It gives us cross-functional capability in the leadership team, and that leadership team together decides on the priorities within the area. They decide on how they're going to work together as an area, so some of the cadences that they have, things like that, that's all managed and, and orchestrated at the, at the leadership level. All the issues and stuff coming up, they all go up through that, through that leadership function, and that helps to prioritize what it is as an agile coach we need to do within that area to help that area um, improve. So this, this is a big improvement. Now, now, we have, now we have the delineation of them versus us at the area level, okay? Uh, the coaches have done amazing work in Air Dreams at creating a real sense of community within these areas. We have uh, monthly gatherings for everyone in the area. We have remote teams, we have people working all over the place. Once a month they get together, typically once a month, try to aim for once a month, it's not always. But once a month they get together, we have these big area gatherings, they play games together, they learn together, they share learnings, they, they align together. And so we have a real bonding with, within this, which is great at the area level, we have a kind of social construct in, in that space. Our ability to execute has improved massively because now we can execute at area level. We can coordinate across multiple different teams to, to execute something across that entire area, which is a big step forward. And we have visibility across some areas. 
there's much better visibility because we can say in convert we're doing this, in our dynamic packaging we're doing that. So it's much better visibility of what we're doing. Still not perfect. We thought we could do better. And one of the things that we had, a real problem that we have in that area level, is that not all the areas are focused in the same direction. Each area now is optimized for its own uh, output. We're not optimizing across the entire organization, but we have increased the scope of optimization from team to area, which is a good increase. Still not as good as it could be, because when we needed to execute things that cut across all the areas, that's still really difficult to coordinate, and we didn't have the mechanisms to do that. So what did we do next? We created what we call three-month value drivers, very similar to OKRs. Right? And we said, actually, there are some things that, as an organization, we need to do that transcend areas, and we need to align people in the areas to be able to work on these things. And so we established a small set of, these are the really critical things that, as an organization, we need to execute on. And then we ask teams, irrespective of which area you're on, which of these outcomes do you align with? Which of these things do you think you can contribute to and are important to you? And they can self-organize around contributing towards an outcome that is defined as valuable to the organization, irrespective of which area they come from. And so now we have teams collaborating across multiple areas to achieve outcomes. And we get great behaviors, like teams uh, will recognize, hey, together we're working on this outcome, but this team over here, they're a little bit short on front-enders, and our front-enders are working on stuff that's not such high priority. So why don't we stop working on the low, lower priority stuff and let our front-enders work with this team over here instead on the higher priority stuff? That kind of coordination is really, really good. That kind of flexibility where we can uh, manage our capacity across different teams in different areas really helps us with being able to have flexibility across our portfolio of what we're delivering. So that's really useful. We now have a better delineation. Uh, we have delineation uh, across objectives, which are uh, real business outcomes that we want to achieve. But it's less of a hard delineation. The social structures are more uh, nuanced now because people identify both with the area that they live in and with the objectives that they're working in. So it's much more nuanced and the much bigger gray areas, which I like. Uh, teams are able to much more easily understand what their objectives are and train those objectives and negotiate those objectives because they understand the broader framework within which they're working. And so there's much more negotiation of objectives going on, which is much better. Uh, and we have greater visibility at the objectives level. Big step forward again. So what's next? Uh, we've been working a lot now, so I'll split this down into three horizons of what we're doing. Horizon one is kind of what we're working on now and what we expect to have largely functioning by the end of this year, early next year. Horizon 2 is kind of more middle distance, the next uh, 6 to 12, or maybe the next 12 to 24 months. And then Horizon 3 is a, is a much longer horizon of how do, we, how do we drive the organization forward over the next 5 to 8 years. So the first one is increasing visibility. There's still a disconnect between what the what our executive thinks is the strategic objectives of the organization, what are the strategies that we've set, the long-term strategy of the organization, and how is the work that we're doing now connected to those strategies? How do we understand the full portfolio of work and how much capacity we are investing in different corporate strategies, how that investment plays out in terms of what we expect to invest and what we actually invest, and how good is that investment versus the return that we're getting on that investment? Okay. Uh, integration with other business functions. We have now got a well-functioning um, product and technology groups that work together really well. 
we've been integrating over the last year DevOps functions into that, into that um, area. Uh, we've got UX in that space. But we want to branch that out. We want to have marketing working alongside us. There's still a little bit of a separate silo. I'd love to see areas that incorporate end-to-end -end from, from business owners all the way through marketing, research, uh, data ownership, all of that contained within an area. The whole, basically the whole, everything that you need for a business area to execute, I'd like it to be functionally broken up and put into those areas that we're working closely together. So that's the next one. Uh, I'd like to reduce the coaching dependency. So I'd like the, the our vision as, a, as an Agile coach team is to help teams to become independent of us. I want to build capability within those teams so that they are self-aware of what it is that they're doing, that they are looking for opportunities to improve themselves, that they are growing and learning together of their own accord without the need of a coach coming to their teams. Because what that allows us to do is a, is, is a team of Agile coaches Instead of working in the prod dev teams, we can then start working in HR. We can start working in CRM. We can start working with some of the business functions and the trading teams and stuff like that. And so we can separate out and we can, instead of being only dedicated to prod dev, we can expand out and take the rest of the organization on the journey as well. And we're already starting to do that. So we've already got some experiments going where we're starting to do that in some of our capacity, around 10% of our capacity at the moment is outside of prod dev. Visibility, how do we do visibility? So we, we know that we've got long-term strategies within the organization, uh, and each of those strategies, we break them down into a set of themes, which we articulate as, business, uh, as problem statements. What is the problem that we're trying to solve within this space? So a long-term strategy might be something like revenue diversification. We are interested in diversifying our revenue away from just being flights and having more revenue in hotels, in um, car rentals, in other spaces. So that might be a long-term strategy. Then one of the problem statements might be, well, how do we engage customers with buying hotels when they're coming on the site, on the site to search for flights? Right, that might be a problem statement. Then underneath that problem statement, it, or the problem statement would probably be articulated better than I've just articulated that problem statement. And Juan and um, um, Isa have been doing a great job with some of our teams in articulating problem statements. But it, uh, so uh, underneath that, we'd have ideas. How? What are the ideas we have for engaging customers in our hotel inventory? How are we going to do, go about doing that? And we could have any number of different ideas about how we do that. Each of those are hypotheses. I think that by doing X, we will increase the hotel engagement by Y. And I'll know that by measuring this metric. So we articulate um, concepts and hypotheses. And then at the team level, the team work on a set of epics. And the epics and stories uh, relate to the, the concepts and themes. Now, we built this in Jira. We have a Jira project called Portfolio Project. In that portfolio project, we have items called strategic items, items called themes, items called concepts. And then in Jira, we link the epics, the stories that teams are working on to the concepts. We roll all that up. And so we can start already. We've already got first drafts of being able to report our, at a strategic level how much our capacity is dedicated to each of the different strategies of the organization. I can tell you which teams are working on which strategies. And I can tell you how they think they are solving those strategies by the problem statements they're working on and the ideas they're working on in order to solve that problem statement. I can tell you which teams are coordinating together because they're both working on the same um, concept. And I can tell you how they're coordinating their activities. And that for me is a step forward in terms of our visibility of what's happening across our portfolio. It allows us to change the conversation when we talk about resourcing conversations Resource and conversations stop being about how many people do I need in this team versus how many people do I need in that team. And our conversations start being about which of these strategies should I invest in? And how much money should we be investing in each of these strategies? And how do we ensure that we've got the, the, the teams aligned so that we are spending the right amount of money that we think is strategically important on the right strategies? And that's important. It's a much different conversation to how many people do we need in each team. 
next thing, Horizon 2, integration. I talked a little bit about integration, so we've got DevOps, we've got other functions integrated. Currently working a lot with marketing, we're doing some um, rebranding uh, on site and, and all of the, the rebranding activities, we've run that in, a, in an agile way. We, as part of that activity, we've been coaching the, our branding teams, our creative design teams on how to work in agile ways. What I see now is that uh, we're getting more and more demand for agile coaching capability within teams that are outside of prod, prod dev. So the most of the conversations that I have with the leadership in the, in the organization is around, I need more of your agile coaches in trading. I need more of your agile coaches in my area over here. And those are outside of prod dev. Uh, and so when, when the leadership in the organization is now calling on us, to pull our resources, uh, I think that's a really positive situation to be in, which means that we need to grow our agile coach team to support a much bigger part of the organization, and I think that's a really great problem to have. Uh, but in order to execute that, I need to reduce my depend the dependency on the coaches themselves, because I need my coaches to come away from the teams and to step up at that bigger level, at the organizational level, and start working in the organizational level. And one of the ways we did that, we had, so one, one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to get all the teams to, to review their metrics on a more regular basis. And we're not just talking about their operational metrics, not just their day-to-day, -day, how long is my customer lead time, how many bug, what's my bug count, etc., etc. Those are all good things to review, strongly encourage teams to do that. But we wanted, what's the outcomes that you're trying to achieve? What, what is it that the business expects you to deliver and how are you measuring that and how do you know that your experiments are successful and impacting that and what are your trend lines on those sorts of business outcomes that we want to achieve. So we want teams to be reviewing those on a regular basis. We think that that would be valuable to the organization. Now we have two approaches to doing that. The first approach is that we could centrally organize and orchestrate that. And we could build dashboards for each of the teams saying to them, here are your business KPIs Here's your dashboard. It's all built and ready for you to go. Now all you need to do is review this on a weekly basis, please, and tell us how it goes. That would be great. It would achieve the outcome of getting teams to review their metrics on a regular basis. It would not achieve the objective for me of reducing dependency on my coaching team. Because we haven't built any capability in the teams to self-recognize that there's a concern, to organize a solution around that concern, and then take ownership of that solution and implement it themselves. So what we did instead is gamified it a little bit. We had a game called Every Team, Every Metric, Every Week. That's, that was kind of the, the, the headline of Every Team, Every Metric, Every Week, this is what we'd like to, like to get to. And the reason we do it, give them an explicit reason to do it, we, we measure to learn, uh, we measure to change, right? It's not just measuring for the sake of measuring, we measure because we want to learn and we use that in order to change, right? Then we said to teams, essentially in, the, in our canteen, we set up this board that uh, uh, really, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a big board with each of the logos of each of the teams, and, and it tells us which teams have, are, are achieving their every team, every metric, every week. So which of the teams are actually reviewing their metrics every week? Which teams have gone out and built a board for themselves, a, a dashboard for themselves? are taking ownership of reviewing those metrics, are taking actions out of those metrics and are changing the way they behave. And then we have a bit of a ceremony where we celebrate, hey, you're a great team, you're doing an awesome job, here's a badge, stick it on the board, be recognized as a team that's doing a great job. And so instead of us forcing teams to do something, now we've got teams coming to us and saying, hey, I want to be on that board, what, what do I need to do? How do I learn, how do I adjust, what, what as a team do I need to do to get to that point? And when some of their metrics are not available because their business owners manually calculate the metrics, then these teams are putting pressure on the business owners to say, hey, well, if you need to manually calculate my metrics all the time, how am I going to get fast feedback? How do I know to adjust? Maybe you need to change the metric. Maybe we need to have a renegotiation about what our KPIs are. Because I need something that's fast feedback so that I can review it every week because I think that that's valuable. And that's a good conversation to have because now I'm building capability in those teams to self-recognize, self-organize around the challenge and come up with the solution that they are. And that removes the necessity to have an agile coach working in that, in that space. So that's the way we're doing that. And we will continue to do that. And I see that as an ongoing evolution. 
continuously trying to build uh, and evolve that, that kind of capability. Horizon 3 uh, is to encourage good decision making. Um, we, we really need to look, I think, at, at how, we, how we delegate a decision making authority within the organization. I spoken a lot, we, we spoke, I spoke a lot about like, autonomy and our learnings for autonomy and to create alignment. Again, I want autonomy. I want the autonomy for people to make excellent decisions. But in order to have that, I need to have good alignment as well so that I don't have 500 people making autonomous decisions without any kind of alignment structure. The way we, we're trying that is we're trying that inside our team. So inside, inside the Agile Coach team, Agile Coaches have autonomy about what they're doing. Uh, we get together once a quarter and we decide on what is our highest priority strategy for the next quarter. What are the things that we should achieve in the next quarter? We decide that together as a team. And we get input from, it's great, because I, I get input from the, uh, the executives telling me this is what you should be doing. But then it's really interesting to get feedback and, and input from the teams and what's going on on the ground, which I don't have so much visibility of, saying these are the things that's important on the ground. And we can bring those things together and say, overall, okay, what does that mean for our strategy overall? And how do we execute that as a group of agile coaches? So we pick a strategy. We pick uh, some KPIs that we think we can measure that strategy with and how we're going to measure it. And then each of the Agile coaches, uh, sometimes in pairs, sometimes individually, you work in the areas that they're working and they do different things. It's, there's no, we going to execute by doing this. Each Agile coach does different things. So for one example, we, uh, we wanted, um, a little, going back some, going back a few months, uh, we wanted to increase the visibility of, of metrics in the areas. And I, I think most of the Agile coaches in the team made the assumption that that was going to be an electronic dashboard. Um, but Linda decided that sh actually the quickest way to start getting feedback on that was to print the existing material, which is all done in um, slide decks, print that, stick it up on a, on a, on a wall in the, in the office, and bring the team together and say, bring the area together and say, these are all the metrics, this is how we're doing at the moment. Uh, let's talk about it and let's just start talking about it once a week. And it was really good because by week one, she had already engaged the area and talking about metrics. Whereas uh, the rest of us were still looking at, how do I build an electronic dashboard? Um, it's a super fast feedback cycle that increased engagement and allowed the, her to build a electronic dashboard collaboratively with the other people in the area. It's a really great example of, of, uh, of how we want, how we as a team are working, whereby not dictating solutions and not um, making decisions centrally by distributing decisions, we get much better decision making because we get different pockets of experiments happening across the organization. We get eight different experiments happening across the organization at any one time. We can learn from those different experiments we can come together as a, as a group of Agile coaches and we can say, hey, I learned this, I learned that, this is working really well, you guys should try that. Um, it's much, much stronger than having decisions made centrally and then told to people, this is how you do it. So that's about uh, good decision making uh, and we'll look at frameworks for how we encourage people to do that at scale. It's, 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 all, it's very easy to do at the moment because we small group of Agile coaches, we meet on a regular basis, we talk to each other every day. Uh, it's much harder to do when you've got 500 people. So what are the frameworks that we need to put in place to help that happen at scale? Uh, and that's it really. Um, that's my contact details. We're hiring at the moment. If anyone's interested as an Agile coach, just saying. Product owners, technology people, we've got a load of roles open. Uh, that's it. Questions? <laughs> One at the back. Hi, thanks for sharing. Um, the people belonging to that silos that you mentioned before, did they take uh, an active part of the decision making on towards which team or area they would end up belonging? 
the, you, my adult coach, the adult coach team. I mean, the, the, the members of that seal that you. Okay. Have yes. Men, men in the silence. Uh, no, no. So I would say that in in the early on um, in our agile journey, we were very centralized in the way we took decisions. Very centralized, and so it was much more a case of here are all these people. These people are going to go here. These people are going to go here. Now go away. Uh, I think we've evolved that a lot better. We're a lot, uh, I wouldn't say we've completely gone away from central organization and orchestration. It still happens um, within the IT leadership team. Uh, but we are definitely working much more towards how we make that, those decisions collaboratively uh, and what feedback mechanisms we need to put in place to help people to recognize where they're adding the most value. And that's when three month value drive is one of those things where we can get better feedback of where people feel that they're adding value and therefore shifts from one place to another based on where they think they're adding value best. Thank you all very much for the interesting <coughs> talk. Uh, I would like to know how uh, did you manage to uh, engage your executive committee with Agile was working? Um, work in progress, I would say, is the answer. Uh, I, I think actually the, the honest truth is, um, so it is a work in progress, it's a continuous work in progress. Uh, the strategy that I've employed so far has been to, to show excellent results. Uh, and, and our team has delivered outstanding results over the last 18 months. To the point that now I've got executives who were previously hostile towards Agile and has thought I want nothing to do with it, that's fine in prod tech, but I want nothing to do with it in my area. I, I last week, or the week before last, I had a conversation with one of them, and he said, I think, uh, I think you need a few more agile coaches in your team because I want some one of your agile coaches working with me in the area. So by delivering outstanding results, and then amplifying that message into the executive, by having, by building good relationships in the exec minus one level, and working directly with those teams. So we, we, we cherry-picked teams who we thought we could have a big impact on who were outside prod dev. We worked with those teams. We took that message and amplified that message. And then the executive, so rather than me trying to push a message onto the execs, I wanted to create a situation where they were pulling on me because the message they heard was so good. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, some part of it uh, is really enlightening, especially this moving from silos to teams to areas. So um, I, mean, I am facing kind of situation in my teams. And what's happening is we have teams that maybe some of them are um, uh, have working on low priority things, and are working on high priority things, and the problem is. Uh, in the backlog, actually. If we want to switch some people from the low priority teams to the high priority teams, we have to take, uh, we, there is two solutions. Either we, should, we take backlog from the high priority to the low priority team, or we take, <laughs> if we remove the guy or the lady from the team and put it to the team. So, and this transition from teams to area, uh, have, have you managed, how do you think you manage it, especially in the <coughs> Especially in the backlog teams, do you have a backlog area backlog or team backlog or what kind of, yeah, mm. it's a headache for us. <laughs> so I mean, <coughs> my, so I'll give you my utopian view first. My utopian view is that a backlog is a waste of time. Uh, a, a, a backlog is an exercise in management. All the time that you have stuff sitting in a queue, it's an exercise in management. And I have to then always be worried about its age, uh, its prioritization, I have to groom it, I have to do all this stuff to a backlog that I'm not doing anything with. So I think it's waste. I think a backlog is waste. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that they go away just because I think they're waste. Uh, so, so what do we do to try and, and manage that? And, and it's, the things that we try and do is by changing the way, so we're pushing back upstream a lot more. Rather than just accepting a backlog, we're pushing upstream and saying, let's, let's 
be a part of the whole ideation process where ideas and um, uh, concepts are coming into the team. And let's start controlling that a little bit more, where we can manage the work in progress in that space, and therefore minimize the, the backlog that the teams are getting by building good upstream and having good flags and indicators on teams. So what we recognize is that when we have a backlog and teams are working through stuff, what tends to happen is that executives get a little bit impatient sometimes. They have a shorter attention span than it takes for a team to deliver something. So they generate more ideas. Uh, priorities shift and continuously change. And because of changing priorities, you can't actually deliver anything properly because you never know what the right thing to work on is. You get a load of partial work done. It never actually gets finished. Um, have we solved that problem? No. Uh, are we able to make that problem visible? Yes. Uh, that means that we can have conversations with people who engage in that and say, well, actually, this isn't really working for us. We're busy making our upstream processes much more visible so that we have an engagement point where we say to people, irrespective of where you are in the organization, whether you're at the executive level or whether you're a developer, if you want to bring us an idea of what we need to do, here's the place to put it. Because in this place, we can run through that quick validation cycles. We can determine whether that is a great idea or not early on, rather than expending loads of money later on by developing it and putting it into A-B tests and stuff. We want to validate early on. It also helps us to flag when we've got too much work in progress by having everything coming in at a similar point. And we can communicate really well about what that process is, why it's important, and how it helps us to deliver a great product. And that communication that helps us to manage how people are injecting ideas. It's a work in progress. But that's our working hypothesis at the moment. Thank you. So. We have time for one more question. Anyone else? No, so only thank you very much, Brett. Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And I think your public is very fine because they are the beauty. <laughs> so if you want to work for us, anyone with a bridge on front, come and talk to us. So thank you very much, Brett, again. Thank you very much.